the lesson is when you start, you have to be confident in your mind that what is coming will be better mm -hmm. than what left. Mm. And that's uh, a very difficult thing to do. I can do things at wet without asking anybody, even my Coney wife. Island, world's biggest barrel of and fun. Anywhere else your imagination takes you. Okay, we've done that now, Mark. We'll get the whole show now. You hurry, hurry, hurry. And anything's possible at Disneyland. Welcome aboard the Themed Attraction Podcast, where we take you for a ride through the fascinating world of theme park design, that is. You've just set sail with us on a voyage of discovery and discussion with theme park industry masters of the craft. I'm your skipper, Freddie Martin, and rocking the boat alongside me is theme park designer, master planner, and chief creative officer of Storyland Studios, Mel McGowan. Where are we after today, Mel? Well, Freddie, today's interview is with none other than Walt Disney Imagineering's former Senior VP of Creative Development, Tony Baxter. Tony's work uh, probably needs no introduction. He's responsible for Big Thunder Mountain, uh, Journey into Imagination, Star Tours, Splash Mountain, and the Indiana Jones Adventure. Uh, talk about Mr. E-Ticket. Uh, he led the creative teams who redesigned Fantasyland Ground Up in 1983 and really led uh, the development of the first uh, Disney park in Europe, Disneyland Paris, which uh, I consider the most beautiful castle park in the world. Uh, we ended up actually getting to spend an entire day with Tony and digging into his decades of experience designing some of the planet's finest themed attractions. Well, it really was a dream come true for me. The interview was a bit long, so we're going to break this up into two long episodes. And we know you won't be disappointed. All right, folks, keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the boat, because this episode is about to leave the dock. Hit it, Sam. So, Mel, here we are at Storyland Studios, um, your home base, so to speak. Um, this is exciting. Uh, we're in the... Uh, Storyland Studios Blue Sky Loft, where a lot of the dreams begin and start and uh, help clients get towards their um, best possible dreams. So what's on the boards these days? What's uh, what's sort of the inside scoop that you can share with us? Well, we're uh, fully booked out here. Um, what the Blue Sky Suite is, is kind of a almost a little retreat center, design retreat center when we're not on the road. Um, we can kind of hunker down with uh, a core team and, and uh, push through the Blue Sky phase. And um, like I said, we're booked up. We've got uh, a Marvel uh, Avengers attraction uh, going on in Las Vegas that we've got a whole team on. That's uh, amazing. I'm still time adjusting from a, a pro bono project we were doing in the Dominican Republic. Um, uh, that one's really neat. It's a whole community center um, uh, school for 500 kids and a gathering place for 300 people. And so that that's a, just a a unique project in and of itself. Um, but yeah, it's, there's always something going on around. Yeah, it just speaks to the, the crazy sort of range, um, diversity of projects that, um, you guys get to do as well. We cool. really love that mix of companies and causes. And, and again, the, the opportunity to do stuff that we're both passionate about and that we, uh, find purpose in. And yeah. so, yeah, it's definitely one of the, the special benefits of, being part of this uh, this Motley Crew team here, yeah, that's awesome. Well, the last time we were in this room, uh, doing recording the episode was early on in the uh, podcast uh, when we had uh, Tom Morris on the show, and that was tons of fun. Professor Tom, Professor Tom, that was <laughs> episodes two and three. If you want to go back and listen to those, it's really great. Professor Tom uh, really knows his stuff and has just um, vast experience uh, building attractions, designing um, from you know. Um, was he the balloon seller? Yeah, I think he was a balloon seller. Well, anyway, he started in the park doing uh, uh, co the the contractor work and just great stuff moving on into a career in Disney Imagineering. That was the last time we did, but he talked a lot about Tony Baxter and how Tony Baxter had sort of mentored him along the way, brought him under his wing and gave him uh, opportunities to fly. Yeah, they had a pretty great partnership uh, that really started back uh, in the Epcot days and, um, you know, kind of continued through Disneyland Paris and beyond. And, um, yeah. yeah, it was really uh, cool. Uh, and that really led us to today's conversation, which is a natural follow-up in a way uh, to that one with uh, having Tony himself. Yeah, so uh, Tony 
he's a real well-known name. Uh, I, obviously, he's he's made himself available to both the fans and uh, the theme park industry uh, as sort of a, a friend of the industry. But you know, he's he's got a well-known name. Um, a, along with so many incredible artists and engineers, the creative legacy that he's left, whether you're a Disney Disneyland fan or a um, somebody trying to work their way through a, a themed entertainment career. Uh, he's somebody to go to. Uh, he's left this legacy. And I wanted to kind of dig in a little bit about what leaving a legacy in this themed entertainment world really means. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because at one level, it's a, a unique industry where you, essentially it's largely, you know, undercredited. You know, you're yeah. kind of part of this uh, collaborative team, which is great. But again, unlike movies where they actually have screen credits, you know, you're <laughs> you're largely. Um, and again, I know, for example, even in Tony's case, who has pr- been pretty out there, uh, pretty outspoken and a lot of fans know him. What, what you don't know is the legacy of all the work that he can't talk about, you yeah, know, the, right. the projects that um, were never publicized. Yeah. Or, or And so I've, you know, been able to, to, to see me. Uh, we first met when uh, he was working on Westcott 2.0. Yeah. And again, that was a completely other uh, paradigm of what uh, a, a park experience can be. I think that some of which the fruit are just now coming alive with the idea of the Star Wars Hotel, where yeah, you can yeah, again, exactly. spend the night in that story. But you know, I, I think um, besides just the creative output and the design work, whether it's built, unbuilt, all the amazing millions of memories made, um, I think one thing that strikes me about Tony is, is again, that idea of, uh, of pouring yourself in, giving yourself, being generous, not just of your talents, but, but actually of your time and, and really investing in um, kind of next generation yeah. uh, kind of uh, folks like Tom, like myself, like uh, Michelle, uh, you know, who uh, he kind of was able to pick off from the Efteling's team yeah. uh, and uh, bring over to, to be involved with things like Fantasy Fair. And, um, and I think uh, that's that's something that really uh, is somewhat rare uh, in today's world, because there's a, a lot of guys that are just kind of not as, uh, as comfortable either in their own skin yeah, right. or sure of their position that are always kind of a little more competitive with kind of younger yeah. <laughs> generations coming up. But uh, again, that's something that really sticks out in my mind. Yeah. And uh, he was generous with us. Uh, we, we, um, he, I, we really got a sense that he wanted to share not just his story, but the insights that can help the industry go forward. So we recently got a chance to go up to the San Bernardino Mount, mountains and hang out with Tony in his little gingerbread cottage uh, just before Christmas. Um, so how did, how did with that happen there? No, well, it was, yeah, it was really, it ended up being a pretty magical uh, kind of uh, day right around Christmas time where we started off the day with uh, uh, kind of our entire company uh, grabbing our annual waffle breakfast uh, at Lake Arrowhead <laughs> Village. Uh, and then we were able to uh, spend some time together again with uh, Tony and his sister over at Santa's Village and get to meet the the, the amazing entrepreneurs uh, and, and visionaries uh, behind that redevelopment. And then literally steps away, um, get over to Tony's storybook, Alpine Chalet, which yeah. literally <laughs> cut and pasted out of, uh, you know, fantasy land out of Disneyland Paris. And, That's right. And um, again, help decorate the tree and, and spend this, uh, you know, this Bavarian Alpine uh, Christmas that I recall from growing up in Germany in the yeah. Alps as a as a military brat. So I mean, it was really a, quite a unique, uh, wonderful experience. And and um, again, um, I know that uh, Tony has podcast invited others into his uh, his Anaheim home, which again right. is basically Toad Hall. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like this is just another corner of Fantasyland. Yeah, uh, that uh, we were able to go down the rabbit hole and enter into. Yeah, so we uh, we hung out with him. We also invited fellow Storyland Studios uh, alum and uh, staffer guy uh, Mike Mulligan, um, also known as Captain Cosplay. Uh, he's good friends with Tony, so that uh, sort of led the way to getting us uh, that that chance to be there. T- uh, Mike himself is a benefit of Tony's generosity with his um, mentorship and and care. Yeah, again, yeah, definitely one of those guys that Tony's poured time and, and energy uh, in developing. We're privileged to have Michael on the team, and you know he he's really kind of a uh, quiet uh, during the the podcast. But you know when you meet him live, he's anything but. I mean, this guy's <laughs> been on stage, off stage, Broadway. He's one of these guys that's kind of a uh, you know jack of all trades from yeah. uh, art direction to production design and scenic. 
uh, painting. And uh, he's, it's been a joy to, to be with Michael around the world. And the other funny fact about Michael is he's kind of a, uh, a cosplay rock star, <laughs> <He> uh, <really laughs> literally, is. literally Captain Cosplay. And, yeah. you know, um, Stan Lee, God bless him, you know, yeah. one of his last birthdays, he had invited Michael to personally come in and, and play Captain America. And, um, and he was uh, red carpet premieres, you name it. He's yeah. kind of a, a go-to in that world, but, uh, what a, what a character. Yeah, it's really good. And, uh, uh, loved having Michael there to share the time with us. Well, you ready for the interview, Ma? Affirmatory. All right. So, uh, I got to do this. Hang on to your hats and glasses. Cause this is our first of our two part interview with our friend, the man, the myth, the Disney legend, Tony Baxter. Well, thank you, Tony, so much for having us at your cabin. This oh, is this fantastic. Is yeah, it's a it's a beautiful, wonderful place. What an amazing setting! What a, I feel like I'm just going deeper into the rabbit hole of. <laughs> uh, well, you, you guys talked me into opening the house up. It's almost Christmas, and having the house open up here is just a Christmas like house, you know. Yeah, and look at really the setting; is. Christmas trees everywhere. Well, we yeah. actually got to help decorate and put up yeah. the tree, and yeah. I mean, what what a epic! I mean, I'm brought right back to my childhood in Bavaria, Germany, in the Black Forest, and some of these wonderful Alpine and Tyrolean kind of chalets. But uh, again, what an Amazing day starting off uh, with waffles at yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Belgian waffles. <laughs> We've got a little bit of a Storyland Studios annual tradition of kind of getting the whole team together for waffles up in the mountains yeah. here. And and thanks so much for getting up early and uh, joining us for breakfast, Tony, and mm -hmm. and getting a little bit of a unique nickel tour of uh, Santa's Village, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, kind of a special fun. place. Uh, and um, you were mentioning you think there yeah. might be some kind of umbilical cord. Uh, I do, <laughs> because the Hanks connection. that built Santa's Village back, just two, it opened two months before Disneyland. And they live right across the street. And this was built in 40, 1947. So that's seven years before Santa's Village. So they had to look at it for seven years. So I'm just thinking it had <laughs> to rub not. off because yeah. this looks Tyrolean and Santa Claus-like and gingerbread house. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Name it. You know. I can see the original yeah, source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned, too, like you, there, some Disney connection with... Uh, at Santa's Village, yeah. yeah. Several of the original Mount Imagineers, before there was a Disneyland, before there was anything called Imagineering, <laughs> uh, worked on the buildings there. And because of the uniqueness of those buildings, they were hired to design the uh, Mickey Mouse Club sets for the television, the weekly television series. So if you think of that Friday Friday afternoon Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, right. it looks a lot like the yeah. Santa's Village. Yeah. Uh, and that was Harriet Burns who I worked with years and years and years, and she was in the model shop and on many of the TV shows where Walt is taking you through uh, Imagineering. Wow. Yeah. That's not your only history at uh, uh, Santa's Village. I understand you've trespassed mm -hmm. there before. And <laughs> well, this cabin is, a, is walking distance uh, from Santa's Village, and we did, and we broke in, and there were like hermits that were living in the abandoned buildings, all these gingerbread houses and stuff. And there was this creepy maze, like Tim Burton had built it. It was based on Alice in Wonderland, and it was all in ruins. And so I had a, one of those little like tiny. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I had a tiny flashlight, you know, on your keychain. And I'm in there, and I stepped on a piece of glass that cracked and broke. And this guy that looked like out of a horror movie came roaring out of nowhere and says, what is it about no trespassing that you don't understand? You know, there were no teeth. And I, you know, I figured this is it. This is the end of it. You know? so I got a picture of that. Yeah, um, that's great. Of, yeah. of the hobo running out at you? No, so. no, but of me just about to go in. Wow. Yeah. And uh, sitting next to me is Michael Mulligan, one of our spatial storytellers at Storyland Studios. Yep. And you guys have known uh, each other for a little yeah, bit, right? Yeah, a while. Through, guys, uh, his brother knows everybody in the world. <laughs> yeah, Michael that's Mulligan. true. And so one way or another, I'm going to meet everyone through Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy. Yeah. And Michael was one of the first, of course. So, yeah. 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 Awesome. Glad yeah, I'm well, not the last. And we had the pleasure of having you come through uh, Storyland Studios a few minutes yeah. ago and check yeah. out our little shop. Yeah, it was great. All the way from the giant, you know, uh, dragon on the top of the roof, and <laughs> you know, you can build just about anything there. Yeah, it was, well, it was really an special. honor having you darken yeah. our door. Fun <laughs> to see it. <laughs> 
Well, I first met you, Tony. Um, I'm sure you don't remember this, but uh, it was around the Westcott 2.0 rollout. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I, I remember catching the bug for uh, the idea of in park hotels yep. and the the notion that you might get to spend the night in the magic and uh, you know fall asleep enter that REM dream pattern, wake up and still be in the rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, and never leave. And um, what, what are your uh, thoughts on, I mean, of, of all the projects that uh, stayed in Blue Sky Land or the Disneyland that never was, um, I was curious um, what your thoughts on Westcott, uh, you know, now that we're looking at a Star Wars hotel, the, the whole idea of um, a theme park experience going beyond just that eight-hour, you know, theme park day do you think that's still you got that legs th- three hours for this <laughs> <laughs> now going back to westcott I'll take it. i think westcott would have its big thing would have been putting you in the park 24 hours a day yeah. in fact even if i was in charge now i would try to convert world showcase in epcot into mm-hmm. the same thing uh the park down there needs a 24-hour space yeah it, it, it's a you know we're almost you'd have to say as big as any major city mm-hmm. with a number of people that are there on any day and the city doesn't go, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, New York has come to the end of its normal <laughs> operation. We hope get out. you had fun. Now get out. You know, like, so, I mean, the idea of if you want to walk out into a park and, you're, and you've got your night slippers on and, you know, you just want to stroll romantically around while they're washing the streets down, so what? You know, yeah. that would be great. So that whole thing, I, I was really disappointed. But you have to go back to when it's an idea that doesn't have a precedent. And we were able in 92 to open the hotel at the front of Disneyland Paris. And it was a fight all the way to get that accepted. Eddie Sato was the designer and I was the overall lead on it. And we literally had to fight off architects that were world renowned uh, who couldn't even conceive that anyone would want to stay Mm -hmm. in a theme park. And I said, everyone on the property wants to stay in a theme park. That's why they're coming to us. They don't want to stay in a regular hotel. Yeah. If they don't, The only reason they're forced into that is it's economics. Mm-hmm. But if they have enough money, everybody is going to want to be as close to what it is they're paying to see. And we did a lot of you know test group studies. And I know from what we got out of that, they can man- manipulate in any way. Because we had 100% of our guests wanting it when we conducted it. Mm-hmm. And 100% of the guests not wanting it when the people who were you know, <laughs> adamantly against it conducted <laughs> yeah, it. Works. Funny how it works. So, but anyway, we built that. And, of course, that opened in 92, and it, and it worked right away. People weren't standing in their underwear looking into <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> you know, they weren't Flash calling. Town Square. <laughs> we were doing a test of a parade at midnight. You know, it isn't open yet. No, they don't call the desk and say, we can't sleep. They go, oh, my God, we got to see the, the preview. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, we snuck, yeah. snuck a look at that. And, of course, Michael Jackson ended up living in that hotel for a year <laughs> almost. Wow. Um, at one point in time. So it broke down a barrier that unfortunately when we were struggling to convince people that living in Westcott would be an amazing thing, um, it didn't get done. But I kind of look at Las Vegas and what happened in Las Vegas at the, shortly after that. It looks like somebody was looking at what we were doing. <laughs> yeah. oh, because there sure is a the lot Grand of reflections. And, yeah. Yeah. You can't you stay bit, the yeah. Riviera. And the, you know, the, all those, you know, the, those are all gone. And, and it's, you know, the Sands, the yeah. Tropicana, all of that old, old uh, Frank Sinatra style mm-hmm. Vegas has right been replaced, yeah. you know, with, you know, Venetian canals and Parisian, you know, towers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's, it's fun. It's a mishmash, but it really is fun. So I, I'm convinced it would have worked, and it would have been very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is a magical urban, urbane quality to walking around the World Showcase Lagoon at night mm-hmm. that does remind me of walking around Singapore. Well, how many times night. have you gotten in from the West Coast at 11 at night, yep. and there's nothing to do? Yeah. Everything is closed. You're on West Coast time, so it's, uh, what is that, <laughs> 8 or yeah. 9? eight and and you go i'm wired i want to go it's closed up everything is closed up you know you're off to steak and shake i guess you know (laughs) (laughs) cracker barrel i I love steak and shake it's my go-to place especially now that they've got magic you know (laughs) things going on all the restaurants so unless you've pre-booked you're not going to get a a meal Well, um, I, of, again, of all those Neverlands, uh, or Never Yet Lands, uh, do you have a, a favorite one that got away or that... Uh, 
They yeah, really... I, there, I mean, there were, I think Discovery Bay was way ahead of its time. Um, it came, unfortunately, after it was it was time to coincide with a film called Island at the Top of the World, which was rumored to be the next Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, and uh, so we were all so excited that the company was turning back to adventure, away from kind of comedies. Uh, and doing something with some power and you know longevity, and we developed a series for television that we felt would roll right in called the Discovery Bay Chronicles. We actually did a um, trailer for that, you know, mm. that's floating out on the internet, I think, <laughs> around, uh, you know, in which there'd be ten episodes and you'd meet all the different uh, players that would end up having some relationship to an attraction or a ride or something that you'd do there. Uh, and we we literally got about four of those really conceptualized so that we could build the ride kind of in advance of telling the story. And it was kind of developing IP off of a, synergic, a synergistic relationship with a park yeah. rather than having to take IP and then develop a ride around that. Mm -hmm. The two things were kind of... So you could build sets for the movie that would go to the park mm -hmm. and vice versa. You could put things in the park that could be used maybe in the movie. Mm -hmm. you know. And so the budgets for... Both things, our thought was, would be extraordinarily higher than you could do for a, a series. But the movie came out, it was not successful, and so um, rather than saying we did a rather unsuccessful and not very well done steampunk film, yeah, it was right. sort of like nobody wants steampunk. Yeah. That was the, there was nothing wrong with the movie, it's just nobody likes steampunk. Yeah. So um, that sort of put that in the, the bed for a long time. but. Um, management changes and various other things occur in companies. So we were able to sneak a lot of the projects to develop for Discovery Bay into uh, probably the most obvious is in Disney Sea, which was designed some of it for Disney Long Beach Sea. Well, Disney the C project Beach, that yeah. uh, convinced me to graduate film school and go to work for the Walt yeah. Disney Company it was yeah. about the week that that was announced. Yeah, Long we, Beach project. we were dead serious. I mean, we had the Queen Mary it had been yeah. purchased by yeah. Disney, or it was in our control, and um, we developed that whole bay. But uh, you know, again, you're dealing with so many commissions and so many uh, entities from the naval and you know whatnot. Uh, I don't think you could have ever, you know, plowed through. You have to, like when we did Paris, the government was so eager to have that project on the east side of the city. Uh, each time there's a war in Europe, they march in from the, the east and destroy everything <laughs> in their way to the city of Paris. So while the west with uh, where uh, Versailles and all of that is developed, it's kind of like the west wood of L.A. area. Uh, the east side just gets plowed under and had been nothing but farming. So Disney came in with the idea of developing that in the, in the city, or the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the country, and actually all of Europe, everybody was in sync. We had cooperation from the government to build uh, the tunnel that was coming in from England hey, all the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the <laughs> tunnel. It, it actually drops people off at uh, our, our front yeah. door. Mm -hmm. And things like that, and the highway, and all of the... Uh, adjustments that were made. All so the stuff that, that we're yeah. still waiting for in Anaheim. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> still don't have you know, you've got to like <laughs> dot your I's and cross your T's that they aren't going to come back on you, you know, with, <laughs> yeah. well, now we've changed our mind. So all of those things were in place, and we went through a horrible economic time right after that park opened, but those kind of things would have never gotten put in place, and now mm. that they are, the fact that you can get up in the Pancras Hotel in uh, the Waterloo Station and be at our gate in two, and a, two hours and 20 minutes or yeah. something like that. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy, you know, so. Yeah, Lori and I yeah. were having dinner uh, one night at the train station. Yeah. Where, uh, hmm, we could be at the front yeah. door. Yeah. 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 It's your yeah. Yeah. That is a fabulous hotel, by the way, <laughs> yeah. that Pancras. So we were talking a little earlier about travel. You're giving me some tips on where I should go in yeah. Ireland. Mm -hmm. and so, well, uh, England. Uh, England. England, yeah. That I know more about England than England. Ireland, but Ireland's beautiful. Well, so uh, that your travels have informed so much of, um, I'm sure, what uh, the art that you've created uh, over the years. Is there uh, a connection uh, to any park that, you know, Tom Morris, when we talked to him, he, he could point to some of the buildings that he um, inspired him to build certain things in, mm -hmm. in the parks. How, how about you? Any uh, travel-related connections well, you brought back? Yeah, I mean, I, I never got to Europe until I graduated from high school, or college, excuse me, uh, and was working at Disney and had enough money that we could afford to go over there. Hmm. 
And but by then, I think I was brought up on an era of film and motion picture and things that, you know, I would see things not just in Disney movies or anything, but I would just build a, a rapport, uh, rap, uh, you know, whatever. I'm losing words. <laughs> A rapport, I guess that's a word. Yeah. <laughs> a repertoire. <laughs> we'll, we'll a, repertoire a repertoire. A repertoire of images and things that would stick in my head. Uh, in particular, I think the castle that Tom worked on uh, in Paris and did the, all the final development of it. But when we started, I said, Tom, it's got to appear that it's up on a hill. And my clock is going off. Yeah, that's great. No, that no, okay? yeah, that's okay. Okay, we're so, we're in Tony Baxter's yes, cabin, that is so there's my a clock. <laughs> grandfather clock that is disturbing me right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so you know we had this castle, and every castle at Disneyland is on the flat. Yeah. And castles in all of the stories and fr- look at the end of uh, uh, Snow White, even Sleeping Beauty too. I was going to say that they both have a castle that's up on a precipice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it. to have these on the flat, it was always taking something away. But then you face, you know, codes like we have the ADA uh, handicap code now that requires a certain steepness. So how do you do that and account for all the things we allow everybody to get in but still create the illusion that it's up on a hill? So I said to Tom, we're going to figure out how to do this. So about a third of that castle is is giving your eye the opinion that you're looking at rock work mm. and that the castle actually starts at a higher level. And we put a fire-breathing dragon inside that piece that's down there. And so the whole thing works extremely well at delivering uh, not just the facility, Mm. but delivering something that lives up to kind of these higher standards that came to me through uh, film. Yeah. I mean, getting to see the real place is is terrific. And I kind of base a lot of things now in the modern times on... The Harry Potter factor. Mm-hmm. factor. How how close does this extremely charming village mm-hmm. look like what uh, Stuart Craig was able to do uh, art direction wise with the Harry Potter films? Mm-hmm. And you can find that. But the br- brilliance of his films is that he was able to uh, put it all together in one fantastic view, where all these little fine details that you can search all over. Europe to explore and find, but you've got it all put together in that film. So I think I kind of came to this with this higher expectation. So it was visiting mm-hmm. Europe was a chance to sort of check it off and see if it was as good as you thought it would be, find things that might be better, yeah. and you could erase in the film one yeah. and say, now I have a real one that's even mm-hmm. of a higher, or in a few wonderful cases, finding something that you knew in film and actually getting to stay in it or yeah. uh, visit it in real life, you know, that's that's another fabulous thing. Yeah, well there's certainly an element of, I've seen the real thing, and I've now, every artist sits down to, you know, even, you know, the uh, your Van Goghs are, I'm gonna paint reality, but I'm gonna paint reality as it feels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get the emotional thing that hits you there. And it's funny how that happens, I was just driving along, minding my own business in England, and I looked off and there was just this amazing structure, it was like a gothic, nightmare of a building you know and i said i'm gonna go over and find what that is and what that is and and i drive over there and lo and behold it's some kind of a country inn Mm. so i go in the price was reasonable and so i'm checking in and carrying my luggage up the stairs and the guy says oh by the way would you be interested in the ghost tour tonight (laughs) and i said ghost tour yeah that sounds fantastic (laughs) So I come down, and there's an old butler that does the tours, and he's shining this big, you know, battery lamp up on the building, and it's all in black and white now. And he goes, some of you might recognize this building. It was used in Robert Wise's classic film, The Haunting. Oh. And I just got chills. <laughs> I was already booked and staying in a thing that since I was like, eight years old is like the greatest gothic yeah. horror movie ever. I'm now living in it. Yeah. And then he says, oh, and by the way, it was also used for Disney's Watcher in the Woods. Oh. And uh, so double, double. <laughs> yeah. yeah, double. So those movie. are like <laughs> wonderful moments where something that you've only been able to visualize on a flat screen mm-hmm. and in an emotional sense, because I think that's what movies do for these places is... When you when when he said this was used in the hunting and I get that goosebump moment, it's because of all the things it means to me in that movie mm-hmm. and that I was actually there. So sometimes, 
you know, these things can be extended a lot by what we get delivered emotionally. Mm -hmm. And that's why theme parks work, you know, I think is because you're in them, you're in them with your family, your friends and whatnot. And there's a greater extension of it having an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. If it's, especially if it's got an attraction or a piece of music. Like when you look at the front of Small World, it looks like any 1960s World Fair building, but then when you hear tick tock, tick tock, yeah, and, yeah. and you go, I'm here, I'm really here, this is really where this is, and it lives here, and today, you know, I am one with it, so yeah. it takes on a higher thing. Yeah. yeah. It strikes me, Tony, you've been uh, part of the industry for a long time, and there's, a, I think, a fair contingent of at least the fan community that would kind of trust you as kind of a, a guardian of the flame, if you will, you know, and a lot of people are really kind of adverse to change and, and tend to kind of have an allergic reaction to kind of whatever is going on, you know, they're almost nervous whenever they see construction walls going up because they're afraid of what's getting taken away from Waltz Park. And it just strikes me, especially when I, the first time I went to Disneyland, actually construction walls were up around Fantasyland uh, and you were doing new Fantasyland. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it strikes me the the radical upgrade from Walt's original 2D plywood painted uh, tournament tent <laughs> fantasy land to uh, a taste of your cabin here, yeah. <laughs> fantasy land. Um, do you do you see kind of a pretty positive uh, arc of progress in terms of the level of immersion and quality, or are you a doom and gloomer? No, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a doom and gloomer. <laughs> Right now, my ca- uh, my big crusade is go and see Mary Poppins return. Yes, uh-huh. yes. And don't carry into it all your you know your you know can't top Julie Andrews yeah. can't do that. Right. Just enjoy a really really great motion picture. Mm-hmm. But each one of these things, you have a, a scale you've got to balance because you don't want to make Disneyland no longer friendly for the people that grew up with it. But you've got to give a reason for people that didn't grow up with it to grow up with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it has to be their era. So the big the big thing I went through was with was Star Wars. And in 1977 and all the way up into the 80s, Disney was not scoring with kids on the cinema. Mm-hmm. And so you were in danger of building a group that did not grow up with Walt Disney mm-hmm. movies. Yeah. The way that Peter Pan and Sleeping Beauty and, and 20,000 Leagues were part of my... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my vision for what Disneyland should be. Uh, but now you had Robin Hood and Fox and the Hounds, and and here is Star Wars, and then there's E.T., and then there's Indiana Jones. Yeah. And to walk into management that had produced those things, mm-hmm. and this was a thing that had to be resolved at the studio, whether we were going to uh, go after you know, George Lucas becoming a part of the company or go after Steven Spielberg. And that got resolved very quickly because Steven is so highly connected with Universal. So it was obviously George. But that was a hard move for not just the management at the studio that had passed on Star Wars, but it was hard for the visitors who saw the very first, when that wall went up, and adventure through inner space, which I worked as a ride <laughs> oh, man, <operator> yeah. <laughs> for centuries. Man, that's <laughs> what I So I know that ride. And I loved that ride, but it was a 60s ride. It was a psychedelic ride yeah. with a story. So you could go to San Francisco and see a light show rock concert with lasers that was unconstructed or you could come to Disneyland and ride Adventure Through Inner Space and they both gave you the same head trip <laughs> but you know one was context and the other was not so it was time for that to go its era was over but you had a whole generation that it was a part of their coming of age so first when, kisses yeah, yeah first, first kisses in that one uh, even more, <laughs> more than yeah. you can imagine <laughs> yeah, right. so um here you had that. There's cameras installed. And then you yeah. had the doom yeah. and gloom that w- Disney has never gone outside their own ability to create content. Never. And now they're buying content from the outside. Yeah. So that was number two. But then on the other side, you had kids that were weaned on Star Wars, like Peter. that was their Peter Pan mm-hmm. and Davy Crockett. Yeah. And... That when we put the sign up that Star Wars is coming, it was like the first new Star Wars product in 10 years. Right. 10 years. So, what the company didn't realize, you know, they, they were attending to the, the doom and gloom and oh my God and all that. They didn't realize that the anticipation for a new Star Wars product after 10 years 
in one theater, essentially, in the entire world. <laughs> they didn't know how to handle that. And so we had a mass meeting the day it opened. I remember the line was five hours long and all the way down Main Street and out the gate. And uh, they decided to leave Disneyland open for 72 hours, three days. And they never closed. And you could just do whatever you wanted to do, get your hands stamped and come back. And so everyone, even though they had to wait in line five hours, they go, you know, hey, this is a great deal. We're <laughs> sending people home to go to bed, and they come back and break us. And, yeah. and so everyone was having a ball with it. And because, you know, in the end, you go, we've got a five minute experience, and people are waiting five hours to have it. You know, mm. how are they going to react? And you couldn't believe how they reacted. They'd never experienced a simulator. It was the first time ever a simulator had been put in a public environment. Mm -hmm. In fact, Entertainment Weekly, I think, voted it the 22nd greatest entertainment concept from the 20th century, and mm -hmm. the, that was during the millennium when they were trying to evaluate all the... Yeah. Anyway, uh, so you had this incredible demand on that. And the people that were of the two other categories of, like, you know, first time we've had to buy, and the I love my people mover people that, you know, <laughs> can't can't have change you know you start to hear that well it's actually better than i thought it was going to be you know i yeah. actually kind of like it you know and you know my feeling that guides me on from that one on because i've had a lot of these and most of them have been for the better you have to say inside your own mind and be honest with yourself rather than egocentric about it because a lot of people can believe everything they do is better than everyone else mm -hmm. but you have to say is what we have planned for this space going to be a better experience than what we're taking down? And if you can't be honest with yourself, you have to have someone on your team that's honest and saying, it's not good enough. This is not better than what was there before. Mm -hmm. And I think the only time I came close to feeling the other way was with Winnie the Pooh. Uh, Eddie Sato had had the good fortune to do the one in Tokyo where they spent a considerable amount of money, a lot. I mean, an e what we'd call an e-ticket. And it's a great ride. It's free, uh, one of the very first free-ranging vehicle things. And yeah. it bounces and it does amazing things. It's a neat ticket. Yeah, but we had a, another era and a time where they said the audience is pre-school pre, uh, and these kids don't know what an e-ticket is. They just want to see Winnie the Pooh. So let's just do the least we can. But you had a, a country bear jamboree. And its only fault was it was old and tired and everyone was would say, oh, I love those bears, but we never go on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it had run from two theaters that were full all the time to one theater that was half full and, you know, then shortened hours where it opens at noon and it closes at six and stuff yeah. like that. So, you know, those... I can't fight that. That's management side that says we can't afford to have a facility, you know, performing that way in our park. We need everything we have running at maximum because we have too many lines. So um, in that case, I felt like we should have given more to make it equal to the country bear. Uh, but he, they are right in a way that for a six-year-old, yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah. You know, yeah. I saw Pooh, I saw Piglet. Yeah. And that isn't the iconology that older people are at Disneyland to enjoy. So I understand that. But in my head, I don't have the satisfaction. A similar one was the Treehouse going from 1960 Swiss Family Robinson um, you know, mythology where my age, you grew up with that, you know, Kevin Corcoran and that. And it's like, yep, there's the treehouse. I remember when I used to go on it. You know, I'm glad it's yeah. there. <laughs> and so it dropped down to 200 people an hour were yeah. going up that tree. And so they were going to take it out and reapportion the space to use for merchandise or something mm -hmm. like that. And because it, it has a fairly heavy rehab schedule on that tree because mm -hmm. those are real branches and they have to be... Uh, groomed and cared for a lot. Individual wild yeah. leaves. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it was it was on the you know the extinction <laughs> list, I think. And then I was so excited when I we saw a preview of the movie Tarzan and it had a tree house in it. And so I convinced management to give us the money they would have normally spent for a parade or a, a marketing event at the Disneyland Park to herald the latest animation. So we got the money as long as we could open it the day that the movie came out. And we beat it by one day, actually. And attendance went from huh. 200 an hour to 900 an hour. Yeah. 
Now, I, I, I always find a way to make sure I'm going to be able to succeed on stuff like that. So I made sure that the <laughs> new entrance was smack dab in the middle of the walkway. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So when you approach it, it's not like over there hidden behind the, the you know, the philodendron. Yeah. It is right there. So if you're not paying attention, you're going to walk up those stairs. You're going up the tree. <laughs> that was so, half of the 900, though. Yeah, but, you know, in that one, there were a lot of people that, you know, the mythology of By the Swiss way, Claire, a really great portal between yeah. Orleans Square yeah, and yeah. Well, that was the other thing. We tried screen. a uh, screen. Yeah. We built a screen there which had never been there before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, really so adds that the was, immersiveness mm -hmm. of Adventureland. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd argue that, you know, for everyone that grew up, in, and I'm, I, I hear it from all my friends because they <laughs> love the Swiss family story. And one of my friends who's a basketball player just bought <laughs> the organ that was on sale, at uh, the pipe organ. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it was just a, rub, a wooden prop, you yeah, know, yeah. all made out of, you know. All you got to do is put yeah. a CD player in there with that. That's what was in there. <laughs> it works a chip. just fine. It was a chip. <laughs> That was what was in it. Anyway, so, yeah, it, you know, so that one's one where, you know, but kids that grew up with Tarzan, and, and, and if you look at the broader thing, I think there's more versions of Tarzan that keep it universal mm -hmm. than Swiss Family, which is a one-off, yeah, where true. Tarzan has come back generationally yep. over and over and over again. So, you know, those are hard decisions. But, you know, I feel all in all, my favorite comment when you're done is from a guest, and I've heard it twice. Wow. It looks like they just pulled down some of the, the plants and leaves and that this was here all along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then that's the way of, the, the reverse of that is they didn't scar Disneyland by mm -hmm. putting yeah. in something yeah. that is, you know, wrecks the ambiance. Yeah. Well, that's also what is so fascinating about that 1994 re, remake of uh, Adventureland, adding Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. cutting the, the Jungle River down, and, and all of that put together makes mm -hmm. that the not only the busiest part, uh, land of the park, but it's just so active and full of plenty of things yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've done a lot in this last three months in terms of, uh, I, I keep saying they're going to spoil it, I know, by opening it up more and all uh, that, but they've, they've to get rid of a lot of the strollers and yeah. baby carriages and stuff, they put seating into what used to be merchandise. Yeah. And that is something Disney never does. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, merchandise. I was shocked yeah. at we all. all were like, yeah. Yeah. And it's in a I good shock and awe. It's so good. And now they're reopening the uh, terrace patio. Mm -hmm. yes. So you can just go in there and relax and sit yeah. down. And, uh, and they put a new palm tree in over by the Bengal barbecue. Yeah. And so I'm really happy with... You know, it's the tiniest land in Disneyland, yeah, and mm -hmm. it's it, it's very congested with things to do. Uh, two of our key rides that you must do are in that land. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it, it's it's uh, an ongoing challenge, and they're you know, of course aware they're going to have huge crowds this summer with the Star Wars. So, um, they're doing a lot to prepare for being able to move people through. I think you know, going back for a minute on Fantasyland. That was Walt Disney. It was all of the stories that I grew up with was in Fantasyland, but in 83 it had reached a, a point where it really did look tired and moldy, and so we had to make this call. And, you know, we were all gung-ho young guys, and there were a couple like of uh, statesmen like Ken Anderson, who was a licensed architect yeah. and designed so many animated films, the look of them. And uh, he was still there working with us and letting the young Turks try their way and all that. <laughs> and then one night we were bullied. Let's go down after work tonight and check it out. They bulldozed today, so we'll see what's there. And we went into Fantasyland. It was all dirt. Uh. And the buildings were still there, but the facades, some of them had been dropped, and they were laying in the dirt and all that. And there were strands of light, Including lights. Ivan Earl designed yes, facades. Yes, oh. yes, That I would be nervous about yeah. <laughs> demoing. Well, in that day, too, they didn't save anything. They felt it was important to destroy it all mm -hmm. so that it didn't fall into the wrong hands. But anyway, <laughs> this belongs in a museum. We got down <laughs> there, and, and it was just about dark. And then dark signaled the lighting to go on. And all the strands of popcorn lights that were along, like the Mickey Mouse Theater, yeah. they were just hanging, you know, haphazardly, like drooped off the. And they went blink, you know, on. Yeah. And I remember Tom Morris and I were—we just, just looked at each other and going, "What 
have we done? <laughs> and that was really scary. Yeah, your thought that Thanos really, moment. Yeah, yeah. We, we yeah. just yeah. destroyed yeah. Disneyland. Yes. The, heart, <laughs> the heart. heart and soul. This is the heart where you you, you immediately play back all the days oh as a four, goodness. you know, a five year old that you stood in line and waited for <laughs> yes. this, and yeah. looked at that beautiful Ivan Derlish mu mural, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, imagined yourself <laughs> along the trail that it yeah. showed the trail of the ride and. Mm -hmm. That was just, you know, and, and it just really stabbed into your heart that moment that uh, how are we going to do this, yeah. you know? Yeah. It better be no good. Pressure. Yeah, it better be no good. pressure. No pressure. I remember, I do remember going on the Skyway over that. I think my dad took me on my 10th birthday, and I remember thinking, oh, we'll, we'll go on, we'll go on, um, you know, Peter Pan next. Yeah. And I didn't know that it was closed. Yeah. And flew over and looked down, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> At least we let you fly over yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Now that was fun. I remember we would ride that ride just to see how it yeah. looked from up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We would imagine what people who were riding that were thinking about what we were doing. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. And sometimes we'd say, we better take that mess out over there because you really see it yeah. from mm -hmm. the, t the, the skyway. How do you tell a story when people listen with more than their ears? Stories change lives. They make us remember, but only when they are felt and not just heard. Storyland Studios builds the impossible. They turn big ideas into reality. They tell stories in three dimensions to stir the senses so you can walk into places you've only ever seen in your dreams, in real life and real time. Storyland's artists, architects, and artisans take stories out of the imagination and build tangible dreams that leave lasting impressions and memories that endure for years. What's your story? Storyland Studios is themed entertainment, destination design, production, and fabrication. Connect with the team at Storyland Studios to get started building your impossible dream today. Visit StorylandStudios.com or call now. 800-218-1932. That's 800-218-1932. Storyland Studios, your big idea's best ally. Well, Tony, we uh, had a great time with uh, Tom Morris talking about uh, the, the opportunity he had to be kind of an overall creative director for an entire Magic Kingdom mm -hmm. Castle Park uh, with mm -hmm. Hong Kong Disneyland. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to that, of course, you had uh, a similar role uh, for Disneyland Paris. Yeah. Um, I mean, what was that like? I mean, kind of, was that daunting, <laughs> to say the well, least? Well, it's funny. You know, when the company gives you the sense that you're supported, then those things are not as horrific. And in the first 10 years of Michael Eisner's uh, leadership with Frank Wells, I don't think I was ever higher, feeling more that I was on the right page. Mm. And the relationship they allowed us to have with them was front door open all the time. So I could go over there, and the only thing that was terrific was Michael's assistant would say, he's in a really bad mood. I don't think you want to go in there today. And she would then say, how about tomorrow? Or she'd say, I'll call you when. Mm -hmm. And then you'd go right in and solve a problem right there. I mean, he'd say, what is it? And I'd say it, and he goes, Frank. He'd scream, and Frank Wells would come <laughs> in. And, he goes, and then he would parrot. So, and he'd go, did I get it right? As he tells Frank, da 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 did I get it right? Yes. And then he goes, and then Frank said, sounds like it's a good idea to me. Great, go do it, you know, and you leave. And so you get a tremendous oh, I got it. Sense. Assistant as a facilitator, not as a bouncer. Yeah. Uh, yes. And you, you definitely then went out of there feeling, you know, that you're, you're charged with a, mm -hmm. a task that they support you doing. Yeah. As soon as you undermine that and you find yourself wondering what they're going to think, and am I going to get in trouble if I do this? And I know their real agenda is that, but I have a more holistic, you know, look at it here. And you start second guessing how things are going to go down. You're in trouble. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, management became very conservative at, at the parks during the early '90s, I think. And one thing after another was closing, and they were taking things out, like Cascade Peak yeah. in uh, Frontierland. And I went on a big campaign to keep that and mm -hmm. you know we were talking multiples of money to keep it versus bulldoze and I was too passionate without the knowledge that I had backing from the people I was arguing with yeah. 
And what happens then when you leave the room, they go, do we have to put up with him all the time? Uh, I mean, uh, it's just yak, yak, yak. And, yeah. and, you know, when you're you're on your roll and you're thinking everyone thinks the way I do, yeah. and you don't know for sure that you've got, you know, mm-hmm. someone watching your back, mm-hmm. then you can get in trouble. Mm-hmm. And, and the other parallel to that that I use is, having a good solid bank account. You can make a loan if you have a lot of money in the bank. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You can't make a loan if you don't have very much money. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So if you Change stick in your, your pocket. Mouth, yeah, if you stick your yep. mouth out and say something, you better have, you know, you know when you leave the room and you've got a big bank account, they're going, you know, he's never been wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I know mm-hmm. this sounds like something we shouldn't do, but I'm really worried that we if we don't follow it, we're going to be in trouble. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And that's because you have this, you know, cadre of achievements that you know keep you in that point but as soon as they start to say anyone can do what he yeah. does why are we mm-hmm. putting up with this then you've got nothing in the bank account yeah. and any kind of a negative comment like that they're going geez you know <laughs> so and so will come in here and he'll go I'll do it anything oh yeah that sounds great because yeah. they want the job mm-hmm. you know and so you've got a million people waiting uh, that's the sad thing about this business. It's tremendously desirable. Mm-hmm. So there's a million people waiting to have that opportunity. And the last thing they're going to do with no bank account yeah. is say, well, I have a better idea. Yeah. You know, right. and, you know, well, so. along those lines, I've got to ask you, because one of the first projects we kind of indirectly collaborated on was a humble little Olympics pool replacement project for the Disneyland Hotel. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah, 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 yeah. I worked a little more closely with John Stone. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, this... Again, it was like a nothing little project. We had a, a pool that was basically in the way of downtown Disney's now shuttered AMC yeah. 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 Cinema. But uh, the idea was to you know uh, absorb that space into mm-hmm. downtown mm-hmm. Disney to kind mm-hmm. of create that bridge to the yeah. Disney Hotel. Um, so we, of course, had to replace the pool, but mm-hmm. the budget that was given from on high yeah. wisely was this replacement rectangular olympic size pool yeah. budget so you know the idea of uh taking the the cards that you've been dealt the budget at hand uh not limiting creativity or passion uh but uh you know kind of rummaging through the parade float warehouses find yeah. the, the peter pan, <laughs> peter pan yeah. boat, <laughs> boat, and uh carving you know then and you know storyboarding this narrative of you the know climbing misty mountains in people's backyards yep. instead of <laughs> yeah. going yeah. with uh you know, a whole crew out there at Disneyland. Yeah, just, built, just the, yeah. the tender love and care yeah. of actually letting yeah. kids be a lost boy and climbing the Misty yeah. Mountains yeah. and yeah. sliding down Crocodile Creek and jumping in the Mermaid Lagoon. That was uh, amazing uh, for me to, wow. to understand the power of passion and imagination, mm-hmm. despite not really you having... You brought up a name there, John Stone. It was <laughs> what a, a talent. He was um, a mixed bag, but, you know, <laughs> in terms of talent, there was no one that had as many skills in one yeah. person. I mean, he could build a model. Jack of all trades. He could do architectural drawings. He could do renderings. Reminds you, um, maybe you, Michael. Actually, I was going to say the same thing. Same thing. <laughs> Michael's one too of those guys. Too much yeah. Yeah. Well, um, again, uh, part, the reason I was bringing that up, was there ever a moment in time where you sh- said yes to something you should have said no yeah, to, like Tomorrowland. where <laughs> Tomorrowland 98. We had done uh, Indiana Jones, which had a reasonable scale budget, and it came in on budget, and uh, everyone was really happy. And, you know, um, I remember I was told that for that budget, it, we'd have to increase Disneyland's attendance, a million people. Mm-hmm. And the attendance the year Disneyland opened Indy went up by three million people. Wow. Which tells you something. You could say, well, a lot of people say it was the last year of the electrical parade and there was introduction of passports and things. But passports had been around many years. There was no reason to buy a passport. The reason people bought passports is because they wanted to go on Indy Indian. over and over again. <laughs> and, and the hotel increased attendances around the new property there went up like 15, 20%. So, mm-hmm. uh, it showed that there was a demand for investing at that Pirates of the Caribbean level again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so here's where the mistake that I made was the next thing I was given was Tomorrowland. And I agreed that we were given the same budget as Indy, but the difference was it was a land, <laughs> right. mm-hmm. not a ride. And if I had the people behind me to back me, and I had the big account budget, I kind of had a pretty good budget, but I, I drank the Kool-Aid a little bit and said, I'll do the whole land for the same price. I should have walked in and said, we can give you one incredibly good e-ticket ride. Mm-hmm. So do you want to take out the carousel? Do you want to take out mm-hmm. whatever? And we're going to put in a big indie quality Tomorrowland ride. 
and you know the attitude was we the whole land needs to be refreshed we can't focus the money on one thing so we divided the indie quantity of money into four pockets so we had the um, carousel becoming interventions where a lot of the cost was defrayed by sponsorship. Sponsorships. Mm -hmm. We had Rocket Rods, who was gonna, it was going to be a design version of the East Coast uh, test track, which General Motors showed how they test their vehicles. And then in California, we're going to show how you design vehicles. So we were going to let you ride on a wireframe, yeah. uncompleted design, mm -hmm. and then you'd enter the design facility at the end of the ride and, and finish the design. And GM was hot on it because it was going to give them beta testing for shapes mm -hmm. and colors and things that the yeah. audience reacted to. And then you'd see these wireframes running all over Disneyland mm -hmm. on the track. Um, so that was another. And then we had the 3D movie, which the theater had to be retrofitted for the movement of the seats. So that was a big cost in, in that one. And the final fourth was for the whole area development, everything. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the first thing that happened is General Motors backed out, and so it went from a reasonable budget for that to nothing. <laughs> and then we couldn't get any sponsors and interventions that would be interesting to see. So instead of having I Apple and uh, yeah. Sony and... It was you Kaiser. Know, it was Kaiser <laughs> Premier <laughs> yeah, it was and the Honeywell <laughs> Thermostat. Yes. You know, Some home builders. And SAP... <laughs> Uh, yes. Business management yeah. systems. And but honestly, as soon as I, I yeah. went searching for my own thermostat and I saw Honeywell, you a Honeywell. I really did. I yeah. thought, oh, I remember this from mm -hmm. the yeah. it worked. Well, people don't realize that, that I, my generation grew up with AT&T or Bell. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah. Ooh, let's go on Bell. You know, let's go mm -hmm. on Monsanto. Yeah. Yep. Who would know what Monsanto is? I can't ever lose that name because Monsanto's Monsanto's. Adventure Through Inner Space and Monsanto's Home Almost of Tomorrow future. and mm -hmm. all that. And uh, the Goodyear People Mover and the General yeah. Electric Carousel of Progress. Yeah. I mean, those are drummed into a whole generation. And uh, I miss that because everything now is instantaneous marketing budgets right. mm -hmm. for how many Not hits you can term. get on the on the, the net. So we lost that. Um, Honey was like opening a film that had been running for years in Florida. So there was no... The Disnoids, they go to all our parks. So yeah, they right, had yeah, seen right. that. That was news... Five years before, so opening Honey had no, uh, you know, uh, sale on it. And I think in the end, I could look back and say I kind of should have known that going in. And because uh, you can't put a sign up that says, "Please forgive that we only spent about a quarter." Of <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, we should have spent. Yeah. There's, There's no, no, no budget. Yeah. A, a hubris dis yeah. disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, but you're kind of like, I can do it, and we've got a staff, great people like John Stone and oh, Bruce that's... Gordon, and we'll all roll up our sleeves and we'll build this. We took old monorail cars and and people mover cars and put them in the pre-show. Yeah, the I loved that. By the way, it was really in cool. Black light, yeah. Like wireframe designs. And um, a guy did a circle vision movie for one fifteenth of what um, they normally cost, and we ran that as a loop in the in the queue line for that. So I mean, in our minds, we were doing really good on what we were given, but the public is coming through the gate <coughs> to see an Indiana Jones or a Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So you know, Walt said you often need a failure, and I think for me. I wish it could have been more successful. I wish if we'd gotten the budget from General Motors, I know Rocket Rods would have been a home run because the track, we didn't have the money to profile the track and, mm -hmm. and make Bad it take the curves and, yeah. and all that. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, that was it, for a while, everyone loved it. You know, it yeah. looked really spangly at night and all that. And then people started saying, I miss the people mover. I miss this. I miss that. <laughs> you know, and, and Honey is, I'm tired of Honey. Movies. The other thing that's happening, movies are now a regular thing to see them in IMAX 3D and yeah. beautiful leather chairs and with hot dogs and things served to you. You've got that downstairs, yeah. right? <laughs> <You're through>. so, <laughs> like, yeah, the day the when, when you went to Disneyland to see a 20-minute 3D movie in 70 millimeter, mm -hmm. that was an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. But by the time Honey opened, yawn, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And we now have filled all those theaters with you know promos, mostly for the ne right. next, next Star Disney Wars film thing or yeah. something. So you end up with, you know, there wasn't much that was at that caliber of fulfilling guest expectations. And so that's why I say the important thing out of this, the lesson is when you start, you have to be confident in your mind that what is coming will be better mm -hmm. than what left. Mm. And that's uh, a very difficult 
thing to do. However, that being said, um, when we did all that, uh, America Sings had been gone a long time, and I think the Bell Telephone film was limping on its last legs, America, American Journeys. Yeah, and true. so, you know, there wasn't much going on. There was a lot of things closed, and the 3D theater, I don't think, was... Uh, Captain EO might have been on its last leg. So, you know, it needed something, but it needed something that was fourfold more than what we were able to, to yeah, do. Right. So yeah, I think I think they get that now because I know the, the 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 look and the quantity of you know expense they're putting into things like a Pandora right. and Studio Tour and the Star Wars mm-hmm. projects out here and in Florida mm-hmm. and incredible the Cars Land incredible yeah. mm-hmm. they spent the right amount so I think it wasn't you know it wasn't in one person's land, court know. everyone yeah. has learned that yeah. Yeah. everyone has learned that and i don't think we'd ever do that again even universal has learned that yeah. the harry potter projects are a good evidence of that yeah. you've got to put a certain amount in uh to live up to the expectations yeah. i've got to ask the question i mean kind of because coming on the heels of that was california venture mm-hmm. and after having worked on kind of the westcott 2.0 proposal yeah. disney sees um were you just busy doing other things, or were you no, like, I uh, think, uh, eh, no thanks? No, no, no. I wasn't a no thanks. It was uh, I was clearly um, aligned with the Westcott and the Disney Sea project, and the mandate for California Adventure, going back to day one, was to conceptualize an entirely different kind of a project. It wasn't in that league. It was mm-hmm. a new, if you want to call it, a half-priced park. You know, and it, its numbers and everything were based on. It would it would perform well if it did half of what Disneyland did, mm-hmm. so everything was sort of prorated on that, and so the the goal was that it would it would be successful. It did that. It didn't do that. It didn't even do half of Disneyland. So the mm-hmm. the realization very shortly was we're going to have to pump it up, you know. And I think you know everyone would agree that what they've been able to do in there has brought it right into a per- parallel with Disneyland. Yeah. That being said, I think it's always stronger if you design the right thing to begin with, rather than having to go in and work with retrofitting something that's already built to be something else. Mm-hmm. Having to try and say, well, how could we salvage this part, but take out that that's not working? And you know, there, there's more money in doing that too than in building it right. You know, you spend a lot more to get the same value. Yeah. From a fan's perspective, it's you know easy to look at like a. It seemed like at least a decade there of Disney management's uh, philosophy of doing these half-day parks of you know from Disney and Jim Studios, Walt Disney Studios, Paris, even a California Adventure, where the idea is open up a kind of something that'll drive yeah, yeah. some incremental mm-hmm. attendance, but knowing that there's hopefully the capacity to then. Well, uh, and I think we're completely out of that era, but I think that. You know, like again, going back to this idea of on a grand scale, it could be a park level, but a ride situation. Let's say the the limo ride, which was mm. in California Adventure, had to be like one of the least <laughs> successful attractions ever done, and maybe the shortest operated <laughs> yeah, ride no. ever done. You know, that's some kind of a major dark ride How long building. Is it? Maybe six months or a year. I can't remember. Yeah, it was, but so now it's Monster Inc. and Monster Inc. is a great subject to do for a ride but here's where like i say the fact that they had to fit it around the limo ride yeah it's um not as good i don't think as it could have been had you created a monster right ride. right and you would have spent less because you built the limo ride then you built the monster ride if you built a good monster, monster ride, ride right yeah. off front and so that's why at the very onset of a project you come to a why that is where money isn't being spent and it's still on you know it's still on paper and it's still we could do this we could do that mm-hmm. it doesn't cost anything to do it right or do it wrong mm-hmm. you now start marching down that path and the why keeps widening and to get it back from wrong is right. going to cost a lot of money uh, as it moves down the right. construction path and so it's so critical at the very beginning to make those right, right. decisions right. and that's where it all goes back to what we talked about at the beginning that you have to be in accordance with all the people that are behind you and yeah. mm-hmm. work, you're working with and for so that they trust you, you trust them, and we're all marching on something. You, the worst thing you want is to hear your employees going out in the back saying, I don't know, I guess yeah. we're, you know, it's job and yeah. I guess we'll work on it, but man, I don't see why we're doing yeah. this. That is the weakest, weakest thing in, in projects like that limo ride. Many people were alerted while it was in early design 
that this isn't it isn't appealing to tourists coming to California for Hollywood, and it's not insider look at Hollywood that all of us wink wink yeah. kind of would mm-hmm. have fun at looking yeah. behind the scenes. So who Who's is going to like it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll work on it. I'll paint the black light. I'll sculpt yeah. the figures. Everyone is kind of wrapped into that, and that's the most dangerous path of all. You want everyone saying, I love going to work today. I'm working on this amazing thing mm-hmm. that no, everyone is going to die when they see what we're doing. Well, we got to cut it right there, Mel. Um, but uh, we got a great episode coming up uh, in part two of the Tony Baxter episode. So uh, how are you feeling? Feeling inspired by uh, Tony's story? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, even the setting was uh, inspiring. <laughs> I, th- I feel a little tired yeah. too. <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, that's a that's a lot of lot of politi- political battles. That's there's a lot of surviving and and thriving uh, creatively uh, in the in the the mix. And I think that's, that's one true. of the things that Tony also was able to navigate. Yeah. So during that interview, he uh, talked a little bit about that delicate balance that we. Uh, that he, especially at Disney Parks, has to deal with uh, the balance between guest nostalgia and guest expectations. Everybody's going to be upset if you take away something beloved, but um, he's, in his words, he said, just you got to be confident that what's coming next will be better than what uh, you left behind. Um, So I just, you know, thinking about what um, your designers do and uh, what the team does, how do we continue to, in this industry, up the game without losing sight of those guests' expectations and the nostalgia factor? Well, I think um, it was really powerful of, of Tony to uh, admit, you know, that <laughs> if there was a mistake made, you know, talking about something like a new Tomorrowland, right. you know, saying yes uh, because of the po- whatever political pressure, yeah. leadership, you know, whatever. Saying yes when you should have said no, you know, when when you want to be a a bringer of truth and bring, you know, some reality of, hey, you know, for the budget of one ride, you really don't necessarily get an entire land. And um, and, uh, you know, I think the idea of moving forward and and making sure that you're not trying to be a historical museum, uh, but you're you're this alive uh, thing that is constantly renewing, uh, you know, and obviously that was clearly Walt's vision for, yeah. for Disneyland. He never intended, uh, to create a museum. Um, but I think knowing the, the, the core DNA of, of who you are, you know, I mean, and I'm talking from the client, the, the experience, the, the, the environment side, you know, knowing what the unique experience that, that spirit, the soul yeah. of a place, the, the, the DNA of a, of a, culture, you know, the, yeah. the, the, almost the, the cultural architecture, not just the physical architecture, and being true to that story, I yeah, think exactly. is so important, you know, rather than just dropping in random IPs, or you can do individual attraction, individual environments, but understanding that there is a unique meta narrative. Um, and so again, Animal Kingdom, no matter how great the ride could be, you know, if you weren't true to that, that ethos of yeah. Saving the world, you know, and uh, rebringing the balance of nature. If you, you did uh, uh, th- this amazing real estate development, you know, bulldoze the rainforest <laughs> ride, as fun as that would be, it would just probably be a little bit of a crash and burn and disconnect. Uh, that's, uh, spiritually. that's absolutely true. Well, uh, next time, uh, part two, we're going to talk to Tony more about his legacy, what it was like leading Imagineering projects during the huge and vastly different economic situations um, and under diverse leaders. I mean, what a um, over, with a 30 year career, it's uh, quite a journey. So, uh, folks, listen uh, to all of those passengers on board the uh, themed attraction podcast right now. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Um, go on to your iTunes, hit the subscribe button because we want to make sure you're alerted uh, alerted as soon as it's released. We can't wait to, to share the second half, but we have so much more coming soon. We've got uh, episodes from um, a ton of great designers uh, coming up. We want to keep them secret, but uh, just know that we won't disappoint you with uh, episodes coming soon. Well, Mel, what do you say we turn this boat around and head for home? Let's do it. All right. Until next time. Thanks, Mel. The Themed Attraction Podcast is hosted by Freddie Martin and Mel McGowan. Leave us a review on iTunes Podcasts and share the show with your friends. Our guest today was Disney legend Tony Baxter. 
We also recorded video of this episode, so if you'd like to take a peek inside Tony's Breakfast Nook, check out our YouTube channel. Just search Themed Attraction. Get access to more stories and interviews at themedattraction.com, the world's most comprehensive site on theme park and theme park attraction design. Follow the action on Instagram and Twitter at Themed Attraction. Connect with Mel by email via mel at storylandstudios.com or follow him on Twitter at Mel McGowan and Instagram at Visioneer. You can find me at freddymartin.net and follow my adventures at Skipper Freddy on Instagram and Twitter. You can find Mike Mulligan, or Captain Cosplay as he's known in the superhero world, at Captain Cosplay on Instagram and Twitter. Our theme music was composed by Rob Watson. Other music provided by The Lost Dogs. This episode was designed and produced by the one and only Dr. Barry Hill. Find him at BarryRHill.com. You know, Mel, Barry and I were on safari in Sumatra a couple years back when we bagged ourselves a tiger. We bagged him and bagged him to leave us alone, but he just wouldn't listen. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs>